Fascia Torah in the old city of Jerusalem overlooking the Temple Mount. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about the Star of David. Hopefully this pen has some, uh, has some action. Ah, do we have someone who's a bit artistic here? Someone willing to draw a Star of David? Because my Star of David is going to come out a little strange. I'd like it as symmetrical as possible. Please, Mayor. Let's hear it from my lovely assistant, Mayor. Later, I'll be cutting him in half. Yeah, good name. You did really good. And uh, if you don't mind, please also, uh, let's, is there another coat in the room? Yep, right here. Excellent. If you don't mind, uh, bringing in all those triangles yeah, sure. inward. So they all they should all meet perfectly in the middle. I think we could just draw lines. No. Uh, no. Really? Yeah. Oh, you're good, bro. <laughs> I had no idea. Wow. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Enthusiastic. <laughs> okay, um, the this object is a seven-sided object, and seven sides are seven sides. Obviously, including the center is is what's going on in the physical world. The physical world's always working in sevens, and sevens have six, and then seven. So, Star of David is six points, but they all when they all fold in. It's the seventh, it's the in internal. And sevens are really where everything takes place. Um, for example, you're in the middle right now of the space of a seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, meaning the walls and the ceiling. Seven's the middle. You're in the seven. So you're almost always in the seven. You know, this bottle's also, the water's inside the seventh dimension here, right? There's, it's got sides, seven sides. And, in the middle, the that's basically going on going on all the time. Also, your own body has these seven planes going on, and your inner self is the seven. Yep. Seven is the internal, and it is it is the truth, meaning meaning the the center of this, which is the seven, the center of it. If you look at the Star of David, it's really just everything unfolded. So each of those. Six is really unfold, unfolded, but when they're all en, en, e -en folded, when they're enfolded into the middle, so then you're you're in the seven. This is uh, this is also Shabbos. Shabbos is um, is the center of it all. And you could call that the first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, and the seventh. Um, we call every day of the week we call it Shabbos. So you have, hi ladies, there's two seats here, one there and one there. If you don't mind sitting in those seats before someone else walks in and you have to move. So sevens are, we actually call each day of the week, the week like today is Yom Shani Shil Shabbos, the second day of Shabbos. So that would be this day of Shabbos. So it's, it, right now we're in the unfolding of the second day of Shabbos, and there's the third day of Shabbos. And so each day is working according to Shabbos. To Shabbos. Mm -hmm. Now, sevens are, sevens are what happens in all of nature. Everything in nature is working based on the seven system. The moon, the moon works in sevens, the weekdays are in sevens. Not arbitrarily, too. There's been societies that tried something other than a seven-day week, and it did not work. Um, the weekdays in sevens, the solar calendar works in sevens. The uh, reproductive cycle inside a woman works in sevens. The rainbow is seven colors. The octave of music is sevens as well. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. It's sevens also. Everything really in the natural world is sevens. And the six, which is the number of the days of the week before Shabbos, and it's also the, the corners of the, or the points of the Jewish star. The six is an, ins, it's an unstable reality. It is a, 
It is uh, in Hebrew, the word for six is the letter Vav. Vav, which is six, is a, it's a pure vector. It's just a vector, it's just a line. And in the Zion, which equals seven, the, this is the, the letter of completion. When you put it together, if you add another Vav, connecting Vav to Zion, and you put another Vav there, connecting it to each other, so then you get the letter eight, which is beyond nature, supernatural. And um, it's also the shape of a chuppah. So if you see a, uh, So the, <laughs> that was my best rendition. That's why I asked Mayor, Mayor, that's why I asked Mayor to draw the star. Um, anyway, but that's the couple under the chuppah, which is the man, male is six, he's the vector, and the female is the, is the zion, which is the, the natural, the, the grounded, the, the completed. And women represent that level of completion. While as men are the are the vector and they're they're incomplete, the the males wrap seven times the tefillin around their arms, representing the the feminine and the completion. Men have uh, all these different things that are to complete them, and one of them is circumcision on the on the vav. The that part of a man's body is called the vav of the man. And that's the actual connection. It's called the Vav HaChibur, the Vav of connection. And that connector is, it requires completion through circumcision, which is the covenant with God. And the, the, the Vav is called the Vav of connection also because the letter actually means connection. It's, it means and. The letter Vav means and. When you say zev ze means this and that. It, it's the connector in Hebrew. And the, when you put them together, when you put them together, it equals 13, which is the numerical value of the word ahava, which is love, one plus five plus two plus five, equals 13, and uh, which is, by no coincidence, the same letter, the same numerical value of the word echad. The word echad is one plus eight plus four, which equals 13, which is a Bob Marley song, One Love. Let's sing. One love, one heart, let's get together and feel all right. Yeah, that's enough of that. Okay. So, but Marley is one is, is singing this song, One Love, which has the same numerical value, one and love. So you can think about that when you say Shema. And, uh, and you know, anytime you're talking about, like for example, Shemo Neyesu, you say, Lama'an Shemo Ba'ahava. Lama'an Shemo Ba'ahava means for the sake of his name, in love. Bi'ahava, in love. So, meaning we're asking God to bring redemption for the sake of his name, in love. But it also could be in oneness. In oneness, ba'ahava is also the numerical, the word ba'ahava is also in oneness. We're asking for the sake of the oneness. Why? Why his name in oneness? Because the whole world's made of his names. But it's multiple names, so you, and you're, they're all locked into physicality, so you can't see, you don't sense the name. That's why we say, when we're talking about redemption, we say, Bayom Havu Hashem Echad, that Hashem will be one, which is true, He's one. But what also, it, when redemption comes, not only will His name be, not only will He be one, which He's always been, but also, U Shmo, and His name, Shmo, will be one as well, and the word Shemo, 
Shemot, his name, which is 300 plus 40 plus 6 equals 346, that that'll also be one, just like his will to create the world, God's ratzon, which means will, this means his name. You'll notice that ratzon is 200 plus 90 plus 6 plus 50 equals how much? 346. 346, which is God's will. But God's will in creation, well, it gets broken up, meaning his name gets broken up in the creation. You can't, you don't see Hashem in creation. Everything's, everything is scattered out into the, you know, the, the different points of creation. Everything gets, gets uh, separated out in the physical world, which is exactly what takes place with us when we're in the, the vectors of creation, the six, the vectors of creation. So when, meaning when we're spending our weekdays doing commerce and pressing buttons and doing emails and WhatsApps and whatever, so it's quite scattering. It's quite a scattering. The, now, ideally, you'd be always acting externally based on your inner being. That's, that's, you know, connection. But people tend to get scattered out during the six days. And, and what happens is we wind up, you know, scattered out just like God's name is scattered out. You'll also notice that just like God's name gets scattered out, will gets scattered out. God's will is not so scattered out, but... Our will is very scattered out. Like if you just think about your own priorities and things you want in the world, they're, they're, they're pretty confusing and, and scattered. And also, have you ever figured out like your top four priorities and then looked at the hours of your day to see if they're matching up? That you've got every, the hours of your day spent, spent developing the priorities? And have you ever even taken the time to figure out if your priorities are your priorities or someone else's? Like, how do you know, how do you know your priorities are your priorities? Maybe they're your parents' priorities. Maybe they're, uh, you know, your, your educational system's priorities. Or maybe they're a priority of, of society or community or government. By the way, there's nothing wrong with those. They may be great. But you do have to take the time to see how much you yourself identify and resonate with these things because if you're not resonating with if your priorities are scattered so then your desires are scattered and, and we um, and when our when that's scattered out if we don't have that focus and our schedule doesn't reflect meaning our time spent developing it doesn't reflect our main priorities so then we must make a shift we have to shift things to make sure we're doing what's going to be best moving us towards the goal of our lives. Now, question, any questions at this point? No questions at this point. Now, there's a lot I'd like to say about the shape of this, this but I, maybe you guys know more than I do. There, there's something about that shape that is the ultimate balance of shapes. It's the ultimate, um, I, I wish I knew more to say about this. I just, you'd have to know physics and stuff like that to know why this shape is there. But it, um, it shows up in the mystical state. Meaning if you were able to go into a deep meditative mystical state to the point of visions, things would start showing up in the shape of the Magin David, which is really bizarre. But you'll notice that, that this shape is a common shape to indigenous tribal traditions. They didn't use it like we use it. I mean, we use it as an icon. It's iconic to us of the nation of Israel. Um, they'll use it more as a mystical symbol in their traditions. It's not necessarily their their emblem but to rituals, like satanic rituals oh yeah for sure for sure well they're also playing around with the uh, parallel worlds yeah, any any indigenous culture that 
has a, has a mystical, um, that they're going into a mystical state, which includes the, the dark stuff, you'll find this shape is going to be there. Meaning if you suddenly were in, put in a trance into a visionary state, you would immediately, everything would move in that shape. So you may be seeing something, you could be walking in the forest, you see the forest, but the superimposed upon your vision of the forest would be this, this shape. There's, so everything would be coming out in that, maybe even thousands of them. I mean, you'd be looking at the forest with thousands of, of Magen David stars upon it if you were in that mystical state. So it, it, it's, that's what I'm saying. I wish I could say more about it. I don't know what else to say except that that shows up when you move into a mystical state. You know, it's just, I just think that's really interesting because I grew up with that being with it being nothing more than an icon. You know, nothing more than just, okay, he must be Jewish if he's wearing that on his hairy chest. You know, like, I guess he's Jewish, you know, and proud of it. So, the, you know, when you wear a big gold Jewish star, you, get, you, you automatically earn the right to, like, if you're a hairy man, is you, get to, you get to, like, unbutton a few more buttons on your shirt, you know, and with that big Jewish star of yours. So... But I always thought of it as more, the, more nothing more than a symbol. And it turns out that, that mystical traditions have it going on underneath everything when they're in their visionary states, which is, I just find that interesting. Another interesting thing is, is that kaleidoscopes are built off of it as well. If you look into a kaleidoscope, it's always gonna come out Jewish stars. You know, it's gonna be, it's going to be, a, you know, perhaps a breathtaking experience if it's a high-level kaleidoscope. Um, have you guys ever seen high-level kaleidoscopes? Like ones that cost lots of money? No. You ever seen one of those? I've seen them. I've yeah. seen the polychromatic rows and all that. So we, we actually have a relationship with a guy who's a creator of high-end high kaleidoscopes. And he sells them every Tuesday in Nachlat Ben Yamin in, uh, in Tel Aviv, which is a foot mall with a crafts fair every Tuesday, um, except tomorrow where it's supposed to be pouring all day. But... Tomorrow? Tomorrow, yeah. Not today already? Which is such amazing news if you don't ride a mountain bike because, the, because it's going to be good water for our country. We need water. That's why this, the month of Cheshvon is considered the, one of the joyous months. The word Mar comes from the word Mary. Mary means joy. Like to be merry. Yeah, and so the word Mary. <laughs> so what if it's a guy named Mary? So anyway, the so the word Mary means joy, and some people say that this month is called Mar Cheshvan because it's bitter because it doesn't have holidays in it. And but there's actually plenty of sources in Torah that say it's actually called Joyous Cheshvan, the exact opposite. It's called Joyous Cheshvan. Why? Because it hasn't rained. If you live in Israel, which is where the Jewish calendar was created, for what it was created for, if you live in Israel, this is the joy. We all lived as farmers. Everyone was farmers. And we've just had six months plus. I'm not a drop of rain. And so the joy hits right after Sukkot when we hit Cheshvan. And all of a sudden, like... You know, every drop of rain is money in the in the bank for supporting your family and carrying on the purpose of why you're why you're here, which is to have a meaningful life, and nothing's more meaningful than than uh, creating a home, and that is the ultimate ex expression of meaning of having your own home, at least internally. The external meaning, obviously, is making an impact on the world, but, but your having a home is your most meaningful. That you can do. This is why men who are young teens or early 20s who are afraid of responsibility are so stupid. Like, that's where the joy is. They're, they're such idiots. Like, you're, you don't jump off a bridge about dealing with life. It's dealing with life that makes life meaningful. Yeah. That's what's going to bring you the most meaning and the most happiness. So, like, love responsibility. Just love it. It takes time to love it. If you're born narcissistic or maybe to a wealthy family, it makes it harder to love the hassles of responsibility and, 
in developing financial independence. But, but in fact, that will be the, that will be for most people the thing that makes life the most meaningful. And this is a big message for men because women have meaning built in. You know, they're really built in meaning people. Whereas men have a certain meaninglessness to them. And the, and the, the meaning comes from, from uh, going out there. And this is why women shouldn't be upset about their man going out there to make a living. Um, and how, you know, women do suspect that there's something meaningful in his life besides me. And that can create certain levels of jealousy and tugging him homeward, and, which may be a good thing, actually. <laughs> Get that guy home and less trips to Vegas. And the, so it's not a bad thing that she tugs on him, but, uh, but she also has to temper it with that, that the fact that, that he does want to leave the house is, is uh, where his deeper meaning is going to take place beyond the relationship and because men have this deep meaninglessness that's only really um, it's only really healed by the fact that he can move his bag of bones around and somehow get paid for it you know like I don't know if he's pressing buttons on a keyboard programming computers or he's you know driving a trash truck or he's or he's working on stocks or other financial things or who knows what he's doing out there but he's moving his bag of bones around and someone's willing to actually pay something for that is uh is very meaningful to men and uh, it could be that the the advent of birth control made it so women wanted to have that same feeling too because the the built-in meeting in women is is the fact that you you are a creator you're a partner in creation you can create and so your life's very meaningful by the very fact that you can create life. Men can't do that. You can do that. And that makes your life meaningful. But once there's the delay in childbearing, the, uh, once you got that delay, so meaninglessness starts kicking in for women as well. And therefore, I want to move my, the woman says that she wants to move her bag of bones around and see if someone will give her money for that as well just like the men, when really they had all the meaning built into their lives, as, as is, just natural, naturally meaningful living. And so that's, that's something you don't want to mess with too much. Like, you, you don't want to play around with God's settings. God, God created the world this way. Yeah, just listen mm -hmm. to your wife, that's it. Yeah, don't play around too much. Yeah. Well, only listen to your wife, only listen to your wife. Mary, you only listen to your wife if what she's saying is, is good. You see, Adam listened and got in a lot of trouble. But then she said something, Sarah said something good, and God says, listen to it. Maybe Avram didn't want to listen to Sarah at first because he was like, Adam tried that. It didn't go so well. And God's like, no, listen to your wife. Eve was telling you to do something against me. Sarah's telling something that's, you know, she's got the instincts and the intuition to know that this is for me. Meaning she's doing this for the relationship with God, to well, send Yishmael packing. Well, it also yeah. depends on if both partners are growing more like this as opposed to this, because if they grow like this, then the clashing is not good. If they grow towards Hashem, towards God, yeah, that's, that's ideal. Nice. Hopefully that's that nice. ideal turns to real. Right, you guys know, everyone knows that famous one about the spellings of man and woman in Hebrew. You know that one? Yeah, you know that famous one. You guys all know that one? I should show you that one. You know that one? Yeah, You know that one? Yeah. I'll show it quickly just because, I mean, we've gotten this far. We might as well finish. Yeah. So we've got ish. Uh, maybe I'll use this kind of writing. You have the word ish. And then that's for the man. And then you got the word isha, which is for the woman. And the, what they share is the Aleph and the Shin, and what they don't share is he has the Yud and she has the He. But the Yud and the He together comes out the name of God. Yud and He is the name of God. And so like, like the word Hallelujah, which is the name of God. So, so they have the name of God between them, like, like Mayor was saying, to grow together towards God, towards God in life. But, but couples that don't have God 
in the mix, they all that's left is I of Shin. Aleph Shin means fire, Aish, like Aish HaTorah, the fire of Torah, fire of the Bible, yeah? So Aleph and Shin is the word fire, and so you have fire and fire, and the word fire in Hebrew means to shoot, like it does in the, in the army. You know, they yell fire. When they yell fire in the army, they're not saying that something caught fire. <laughs> they're saying, shoot the gun. So there's fire and fire going on in, in marriage when God's not involved. Now, just to tell you on a very practical level, we have a commandment in the Torah. One of the 613 commandments is to cleave to God. That's to be at one with God. It's from the word, it's the word uh, devekut or devekus. The word devekus is the word for sticking also. Like modern Hebrew, the word devek is glue. Tape is also called devik. And, uh, and so it means to stick yourself to God is, is devekos, to fuse some two things together is devekos. You with God is called devekos. Um, but the Rambam explains that a physical person, a physical body cleaving to God, becoming dovek to God, is sometimes a tall order, especially if that person's not involved in meditation. So what's the next best thing? Is to cleave, this is what the Rambam says, cleave to those who are cleaving to God. Cleave yourself, and this, like, this is one of the foundations of having a Rebbe, is cleave to someone who's made their way to the, to the, they have achieved cleaving to God. Cleave to someone who cleaves to God. Again, that's a very Hasidic perspective of the Rambam sharing a couple hundred years before Hasidut, but you cleave to the person who's cleaving. And what's amazing about this, that in marriage, you're going to have disagreements. That's just part of married life. You're going to disagree. When you disagree, you can literally feel the Shekhinah disappear. It's a weird thing, but you feel the presence of God go away from the home. And it's really weird because you're not discussing God and you're not discussing anything spiritual. You're just arguing about some point, maybe something to do with the children or... So it could be very important, but you don't agree. And whenever you disagree with a spouse, it, it, there's a way over proportionate sense of loss going on in there, which is weird because you can argue with a friend and it's not that level of sense of loss. <laughs> when you argue with a spouse, there's this emptiness that fills the space. It also makes kids really nervous. When they see parents arguing, the kids get, get nervous and it just is uncomfortable. Now here's the cool thing. You call your Rebbe, you get your Rebbe on the phone, and you bring up the subject and let the Rebbe give his two cents on how to do it. And really wise Rebbe's will generally split the situation into further distinctions to show how you're both right. Like a wise Rebbe will say, oh, you guys think you're arguing, you're not. Because in this situation, you'd both agree. And in this situation, meaning you'd both agree with her, and in this situation, you'd both agree with him. So we just need to split this into a deeper or a more distinguished subject, or more distinguished subjects. And then you'll see that you actually agree. And there was actually a famous rabbi. Oh, it's late. I'll just finish with this. There was a famous rabbi, sorry, Mayor, I know you have a question. There was a famous rabbi that, um, his name was Papa. Yeah, I just have to share this because I've already written so many things on the board. There was a famous rabbi by the name of Papa. And Papa, these were nicknames. Most of the rabbis in the Talmud, that's not their name. A lot of people don't realize that. His name wasn't really Papa. It was his nickname for the Talmud. Rabba's name. No one named their kid Rabba. And no one named their kid Rova either. Okay, these are not names of kids. Akiva's a name. Okay, Akiva's a name. But, uh, but most of the names there are actually nicknames. Now, the name Papa is, he was a famous rabbi. He had a lot of kids. And he was, he was big. Uh, I mean, wide not tall. He was, he was kind of a chubby guy. And Rav Papa 
was not only chubby, he was a, he was a jolly guy. And not only was he a, a robust and jolly guy, he was a beer salesman. He actually made date beer and sold date beer. Uh, that's how he made a living, was selling beer. And very interesting, when you're learning a piece of Talmud and there's an argument on that particular page, what you'll notice on that page of Talmud where they're arguing, oftentimes, Rav Papa shows up. And it says, Rav Papa, Amar Rav Papa, or Rav Papa Amar. And what does he do? He brings what's called a yukimta. And a yukimta is where you s state that what he's saying, and what he's saying is not an argument. You just need, you didn't distinguish the cases. Whereas if you look at it in this case, they're both gonna agree on that one. And if you look at it in this case, they're both gonna agree on that one. And that's how he earned his nickname because the word peh means mouth. And the other word means mouth, peh, peh, echad is one. That what, he's, what his mouth, his pet is saying, and what his pet is saying, what his mouth is saying are really one. And therefore it's really important when you have a marriage when you get married, is to have a Rebbe that you can call when you feel the divine presence leave the home and everyone's feeling really uncomfortable, is to just make that phone call and let the Rebbe distinguish and show how everyone truly agrees. Shalom, everybody. Shabbat. Okay, for those who need to break a couple minute break.